Hi, everyone. This is Matthew from the Teflology Podcast. We are back with the second in our series of interviews from the PANSIG 2019 conference, in which the invited speaker's plenary addresses were conducted in the form of interviews with follow-up questions from the audience. This episode features my fellow Teflologist, Matt Turner, talking to Stephanie Ann Houghton. Professor Houghton is an associate professor in the Faculty of Art and Regional Design and the Graduate School of Regional Design in Art and Economics at Saga University in Japan. She has written extensively on the development of intercultural dialogue and native speakerism. Matt spoke to her about these issues, plus the links between dance, fitness, and intercultural communication, as well as the preservation and revitalization of traditional Japanese culture. Enjoy. So, um, firstly, I should say that Stephanie and I have already been talking for about two hours today. So you're, you're, you're seeing the second part of that interview today. Okay, so um, first of all, I'd like you to, um, could you briefly introduce yourself and your, your, your history? Right. Okay, so, um, when I was thinking about this interview today, I, I thought I could present myself as an academic, which... I could still do, but I don't want to start with that. I want to start with the fact that uh, in the year 2000, after I'd been teaching on the JET program uh, for three years, from 1993 to 1996, uh, I find myself um, working at Kitakushi University, again on a term limited contract, where I couldn't stay, there's a limited number of renewals, and because I was getting more settled in Japan, um, I was becoming increasingly frustrated at the fact that I was always being expected to, to prepare for the next person to replace me. And I'd had enough. And uh, I was suffering and struggling and I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to accuse the university of uh, racial discrimination. But that was the only word that I had to, um, to really use uh, as a conceptual reference point for what I thought was happening to me. I couldn't read Japanese, I could hardly speak Japanese at that time, so I was really, really floundering. Um, so basically the story of, of my life in Japan really as an as a active person in society begins with uh, the, my, my personal response to discrimination. Um, but at that time there was no word uh, in the English language to describe the kind of um, prejudice and discrimination against people based upon whether they're considered to be a native speaker of a language or not. And, um, but that, that was the, the problem that we were faced with and it became a group issue at my university as the Gai Kokujin Kyoshi, the foreign lecturers, we started to unite to tackle this problem. Um, but the university line was, as it was in many universities, um, that Japanese people could be foreign lecturers if they were native speakers of English, which didn't make sense at all at the time. So the, the university labor union, the in-house labor union, gave us a nice opportunity to, to write an article. They helped, me to, helped us to collect uh, accurate information about our situation and to write it in English. So the first time I wrote anything was a paper in that journal uh, entitled, All the Foreign Lecturers Are Foreign, Where Are the Non-Foreign Foreign Lecturers? <laughs> That's how it started, and that is when I became a writer. It had nothing to do with academia, it was workplace struggle, and it was very personal, and um, eventually it became academic, but that's how it started. So that's where you see there, so Gai Kokujin Kyoshi experiencing discrimination. I explored what teachers should do about prejudice in their language classes through a PhD at Durham University with Mike Byram. Um, and the, the PhD activity was running parallel to the labor union activity I was engaged in. I think I was the first foreign labor union president in Japan, I was told at that time, um, and became increasingly active and actually reported the Japanese government to the United Nations when the special rapport, rapporteur came, Dudu Dien, a number of years ago now. Uh, so I really went as far as I could down that line to complain. Um, a great risk to myself, I felt in the beginning, but as you can see, I'm still here. <laughs> um, so native speaker 
tourism was a word that Adrian Holiday coined, apparently in 2003, not in 2005. But the discovery of that word really changed everything and turned it into an academic issue, uh, which we can go into later mm -hmm. in relation yeah. to the books. Yeah. And then um, I moved into the Faculty of Art and Regional Design more recently, and that brought in dance as nonverbal communication, as you'd said. And that has led to a focus on Alzheimer's disease prevention, so health issues, brain-related issues in relation to language learning and more recently to local mask dance, which is suffering uh, in Japan's ageing society. Remember you. Yeah, and yeah, some of those points are uh, dancing. Um, we're going we're to come on to those points later on. Um, Stephanie, one of your areas of interest is also intercultural communication. And I believe on the next slide we have a list of some of the themes that you've looked at here. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could just briefly talk about your, um, your developments in this field. Right, thank you, yes. Um, so on the bottom left, you can see a group of eight books. So these are the eight books that, um, that I had published after finishing my PhD. And you can see I've highlighted the keywords, stereotypes, intercultural competence, identities, critical cultural awareness, intercultural dialogue, uh, those kinds of themes in the space of four years, with strong focus ultimately on native speakerism and post-native speakerism. Um, on the right, you can see the book series that I established with Melina Porto through Springer upon their invitation, uh, which since it started in 2015 um, has resulted in the publication of three books. We have four more in the pipeline. And you can see very, very similar uh, key terms emerging in there as well. And um, you've already touched upon this point about kind of stereotyping and um, value judging, and you, you found this yourself from your own experiences. Um, Intercultural communication. Um, could you tell us about how language teaching may be used to manage and mitigate these kind of things, such as stereotyping and, and value judging? Mm. Yes, and I think this is an important point to clarify at the start of this, this interview, is I, I don't think I've ever read anything that suggests that stereotypes can be overcome. So stereotypes are a natural part of the, the brain's processing of information. You know, the, the world is very complex, so as we look at the world and we take in information, the brain has to categorise the information into groups, and that includes information about the self and one's own group memberships and also of other groups. Um, and the brain also has a wide range of cognitive biases which are kind of built into the system, shortcuts if you like, to, to try and make sense of the world quickly, um, which it could be good in some ways, but one of those biases uh, seems to be quite universally that people tend to evaluate their in-group uh, more favourably than the out-group. Mm. Um, and to apply you know, pre-existing information about a particular group to a person when they realise they're a member of that group, which might be evident by, by skin colour uh, in, in a person's mind. You might think, oh, the white person, and therefore blah, 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 blah. Like in camp, boom, and you, you kind of stamp them in your mind. Um, but language teaching, I don't think, can overcome. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything can overcome stereotypes. But we can do to a certain extent. We can raise awareness of what happens in the mind when we're engaging in intercultural experience. And we can um, increase understanding of what stereotypes and other forms of prejudice are. And we can develop the critical faculty, so criticality, critical cultural awareness, critical thinking. Critical, critikos, comes from the ancient, the, the Greek critikos, which means judgment. Um, so we can, we can aim to uh, develop better quality judgment than we might otherwise do without the critical reflection, without the ability to reflect on ourselves and monitor and try to control, to some extent, what we're doing, how we're thinking and the impact we're having on the world and people around us. Yeah, I guess, I guess to some extent, um, all teaching has, is intercultural in a sense, when you're interacting with your students and the students are interacting with you. There's always going to be an intercultural element. Um, in terms of identity, in terms of a teacher's identity, yes. how can we kind of address the interculturality? I think that's a word. Um, how can we address that about ourselves as teachers? Yeah, so the teacher is a, a cultural agent. A teacher is a person. A teacher is a carrier of culture. Is a, um, have, the teachers have their, their own personal identities, their own social identities. Yeah. Um, and so the teachers themselves need um, certain levels of, of self-awareness in order to be able to guide uh, the students um, and to prepare them for the world ahead. Yeah. Um, in general terms. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what 
one of, like we've touched upon before, one of those identities that are often kind of given to us, I guess, is this idea of the, the native speaker. Um, I'm not sure how aware everyone is, but the, the native speaker term is a very fuzzy, fuzzy term. Could you kind of summarize the, the kind of the tensions around this term to begin? Mm. Well, I think the, the word itself, um, according to Damien, who I've, Damien Rivers, who I've collaborated with a lot over the years, he tracks the origin of the word back to the late, well, about 1858, used in the United States um, as a point of discussion around um, British English and American English. Uh, so it was within English itself. Um, the way that we, we see it used here in Japan these days, um, in terms of its problematic aspects, is um, teachers are employed uh, based upon uh, whether they're considered a native speaker or not. Uh, how to decide whether somebody is a native speaker is not an easy thing. Why? Because the, the, there's no real definition that can be applied uh, in any case, as far as I can see. Um, people have wide ranges of language repertoires, they have a wide range of cultural experience, so it really is a question of being ascribed a certain status based upon other factors which can bring into uh, consideration factors such as race or gender or national origin, uh, all sorts of uh, stereotypes and assumptions uh, which come into play. Um, and in terms of employment, if you're being categorized as a non-native speaker, then this might uh, make it very difficult to gain employment in the first place. So discrimination at the pre-employment stage. But if you're categorized as a native speaker, you may have an advantage and get the job. But then once you're in, to be discriminated against at the post-employment stage, so the types of discrimination, the points in time at which it occurs, uh, might uh, vary. Um, and it's also very, very trapping. So I think one of the issues in human rights law is to protect people from being punished for factors that they, they themselves cannot change. So you can't easily change whether you're a man or a lady. Even with technology, these things are, themselves are changing. But certain things that we can't change about ourselves, we, we shouldn't be um, uh, treated for unfairly. So one, one point is, do I categorize myself as a native speaker or not? But then, do you categorize other people as native speakers or not? This brings into play interpersonal, intercultural yeah. dynamics. Uh, but when institutions are using this term as a, as a, a way of uh, sifting through job applications, as a way of um, judging people during interviews, as a way of uh, deciding who gets a job and who doesn't, then it becomes more problematic if it's institutionalized as a system within one institution. Uh, but the problem in Japan is that it was institutionalized on a national level uh, for a very long time. You know, this is a very, very long history rooted in the Gaikoku Jinkyoshi system itself, which goes back you know, around 100 years, uh, not more. And, um, and so it really was a, a matter of national policy, which is connected to citizenship as well in the past. The law has changed considerably in the last 10, 20 years. Um, but the citizenship, citizenship requirement for public servants, for, for civil servants in the past, was something that we were struggling with from the year 2000 to 2005, because only Japanese citizens in those days could be public servants. And there was a special category of guy called in Kyoin to allow for the employment of some foreigners, and that was based on, I think, nationality. Um, but then the guy called in Kyoshi system then was kind of latched onto that system as like an extra branch in order to employ more foreigners, I'm, I'm choosing to say now, um, but racial discrimination or discrimination based on nationality is and was against the law. And so the native speaker criteria, I think, was used as a mechanism for getting around discrimination based on nationality. That's my personal view. Obviously. And um, to what extent are we, are we now in a, a post-native speakerist kind of era, I should say? We, we last spoke five years ago. Yes. Um, has, has anything changed in that time in terms of the the professional um, realm, I guess, and um, the theoretical and research side of things. Yes, well, I think um, I think the coining of the word native speakerism itself has had a massive impact. That's one thing, but also um, into the field of intercultural communicative competence, which is connected to the, the common European framework, um, uh, has also been very very influential. Uh, intercultural communicative competence. Uh, was intended to replace native speakers as a socio-cultural mm. 
criterion, not linguistic, okay. originally. I see. But nonetheless, there was a rejection of the native speaker involved in promoting this idea of intercultural communicative competence. That's another branch. Another branch is English to lingua franca, which is picking up speed independently. That's been absolutely massive worldwide. And that, that taps into you know, the frustration of so many people who are categorized as non-native speakers of, of English who are frustrated at discrimination. It's the same thing. We do not want to be discriminated against unfairly. Nobody wants that. And then the other thing is world Englishes, which also rejects the native speakers. So there are a lot of um, uh, important developments in different fields within English language education in particular, which were dovetailing, have been dovetailing, continue to dovetail you know, uh, until today. Yeah. And then this word post-native speakerism attempts to try to capture to that, try to really push this, this, the problems related to native speakers <coughs> out completely, but that hasn't happened yet. I see, yeah. So I have two tables, which I, I, I put at some research funding uh, from the, the Japanese government for a Kakehi project, uh, which finished in 2013, and I interviewed uh, many uh, experts, uh, doctoral level, postdoctoral level, and some very famous uh, people in the ELT field, about their views on uh, what should be used to replace a native speaker concept. And I interviewed people specifically from those three fields I just mentioned, intercultural communicative competence, English as a lingua franca, and world English issues. And I tried to collate their ideas, and I, and I came up with these two tables. So one set of shifts which um, are needed, I think, are in the educational activities of the foreign language teacher. So you can see on the left, we need shifts from uh, the native speaker model towards more diverse models, plurilingualism, um, acceptance of language variety, non-nativeness. Um, second one, uh, not seeing language as a fixed good in itself with predefined uh, norms that can't be changed and attached to particular countries and with a view um, that we should be looking at language as a vehicle, emergent language, emergent grammar, prioritising uh, non-native speaker interaction because that's far more common these days, assuming that you accept the idea of a non-native speaker. Um, dropping the insistence on accuracy and, and uh, error correction, dropping the focus on target culture as content, dropping teacher-centeredness to some extent, dropping the reliance on published materials, uh, moving towards more learner-centered, teacher-generated materials that present a range of different types of Englishes that can be used in the world, and translanguaging, being able to move flexibly from one type of accent to another to another, depending on who you might meet, which could be someone from Brazil in one second and somebody from the Philippines in the next. You have to be flexible. So the flexibility that's needed in actual intercultural interaction in today's world uh, requires a lot of these kind of shifts in activities to be um, inspired. And then the next visual focuses on the desirable characteristics of the foreign language teacher in terms of the kind of skills and competences, knowledge base, background, and <coughs> cognitive tendencies and attitudes of the teachers themselves, which goes back to the question yeah. you asked me earlier. I see, yeah. And this phenomenon is also kind of manifest outside of teaching as well. Um, so, as everyone knows, uh, Japan's society is rapidly aging, and the prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease um, has what do I want to say? Goes along with that too, I guess. Um, along with that, we're also seeing the rise in robotic caregivers too, and automatizing um, the caregiving industry. Um, what are the links between native speakerism and that side of things too? Because mm -hmm. I believe that there is one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of there's a big shift. shift there, sorry. Yeah, there's a really big shift, and that happened because I changed faculty. So I was in the Faculty of Culture and Education, which closed down. Yeah. After that, I moved to the Faculty of Art and Regional Design to teach intercultural communication. So I, I thought, then, well, what shall I do? And actually, after publishing those eight books, I was really fat. I'd put on a lot of weight. I was unhealthy in my early 40s. And um, I was about 74 kilos, whereas now I'm about 60 kilos. And um, so health was becoming an issue. And I lost weight within six months doing Zumba. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, so suddenly Zumba took over my life. And this is personal. <laughs> 
This is personal, and you can see me on the left there dancing in my wig. I started wearing wigs to make myself look younger, and I like the look of it. And I was dealing with identity, you know, how, how to um, connect art and identity and self-presentation. It was interesting me a lot, and you can see me teaching my students in my first ever Zumba class once I'd got my qualification in those days. You can see my Zumba teacher, the young man in the middle on the right, Miyata Sensei, who I've been collaborating with for four years now. And above him, the man who invented Zumba in Colombia, uh, known as Betozan in Japanese. So basically, Zumba is a combination of dance and fitness. And the dance, basically, is Latin dance. And in Latin dance, basically, you can track the cultural roots right back to Africa, to the times when African people were taken forcibly to the Americas by the slavers. So I became familiar in, in, in that, those early stages of, of looking at the cultural background that brought in the intercultural communication. Yeah. The dance is a form of nonverbal communication, which nonverbal communication is, is, is not emphasized so much in intercultural communication. And the fitness side fitted in nicely with the regional design and community development and health issues. Yep. So that's why there was suddenly a, a, a massive shift, massive sudden shift, as I started exploring these new areas. And one point was the students, I did lots of events, the students complained. Why do we have to dance? Why do we have to move our bodies? They just like to sit quietly, right, with the mobile phones. Why do we have to move? And, um, and they didn't want to pay for events, because art is expensive, and, and I was asking them to, to pay you know, a few thousand yen for, for an event. So there were, there were, there were formal complaints uh, to the university about my dance program by some students, not all, but there were quite a lot. So I was forced, I was forced to justify my educational program. So I was looking around for, for reasons why dance was important, and I knew instinctively that it was. Um, and I found that dance, uh, appears to play some role in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. And I saw that and I thought, oh, wow, that's important. That's important. And I, I realised my own brain was changing in my early 40s. And I wasn't sure why, but brain change from the early 40s is a normal thing I have, I have learned now. And... Um, also, at that time, my husband was pushing me to take a future-oriented view of everything. He's very interested in robotics, the impact of AI on society, an aging society. There's a very good book called The Hundred Year Life by Grattan and Scott. And something like half of the babies born in Japan today are expected to live until what age? 107. 107. But the brain, the brain can't necessarily keep up with a healthy body. So we have to really make a big effort to promote healthy aging, brain health, so that people who do survive to 107 years, or to, to, who live a long life, they're living a healthy life. So they're not living with the brain switched off in, in, in a body where the heart is still pumping. So this is very, very important, I think. And, um, and so aging society, taking a future-oriented view, as soon as I realized this, I noticed that none, not one, of the experts that I interviewed in my Kakangi project about replacing a native speaker, not one of them was taking a future-oriented view. And by that I mean looking across a wide range of disciplines to see what people from other disciplines are saying about the way that the human race is developing and where we're going, you know, based upon current social trends. And so that's what I'd like to encourage you to do, is to, to become a futurologist, to try to anticipate where it is we're going to be, in, oh, oh, and here we go. If you look in terms of health, United Nations World Population Aging Highlights 2017, we can see that from 1980 to 2050, the top five countries with the largest share of persons aged 60 years or over, Japan was not even in the top five in 1980. 2017, uh, we have 33.4% of Japanese people um, aged 60 above. And Japan was the top country there. And then 2050, 42.4% of people in Japan are expected to be over the age of 60. So Japan's the fastest aging country in the world. So Japan really, really, really needs to take this on board. And so if dance and language learning and other things can help to protect brain health, then that's what we do. And that's what teachers need to be doing. And for that to do that, we have to know about it first. And the governments are dropping the ball on this. And so we have to do it. 
because the governments and the, the World Health Organization just released um, a set of dementia prevention guidelines just this week. Good. It's a bit late because this information has been coming through from the, res the researchers who are you know, ahead of the game, who are uh, you know, publishing on, on TED Talks and, and YouTube and individual papers. But of course, World Health Organization and these, these big research centers such as the Wiking Center in T Tasmania University, um, they take a meta-analysis of a wide range of studies, very advanced analysis, before governments can even think of making sets of recommendations. But you, you know, you go in your mobile phone now, you can find so many recommendations. If you find them, they're not going to harm you, but they might help you. And if they might help you, then do them. You know, think about doing them. It's not rocket science, the kinds of recommendations they're coming through with. You, earlier when we, we talked, you talked about the idea of the, the in-group and, and the out-group, and the idea of, of an alien. And could you briefly talk about how that might be good for, for the brain? And right. So the, the, the question is with language, so foreign language learning. Also, there's research suggesting that um, learning a foreign language, bilingualism, um, might, can, uh, not necessarily prevent, but delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease for four or five years. Four or five years. Um, so here, you see healthy linguistic diet. So these two people are, I think, Polish, but working in the UK. Uh, the gentleman on the left, Thomas Bach, is based in Edinburgh, and then Diana, a very long Polish surname I can't pronounce, but she's based in London. Um, and so they, they are recommending bilingualism as a way of uh, promoting brain health, which means they're promoting plurilingualism, and they're actively standing against the native speaker as role model in foreign language education, and they're against monoling monolingualism. This is my understanding of what they're saying. And so, um, to link that back to native speakers, if you like, um, this means that we need to kind of take on board otherness more broadly, more broadly. Taking on otherness, you know, can start in childhood. Bilingual children, you know, you learn a new language, then you develop an awareness that there is another language out there, develop a theory of mind. And um, what it seems to do is, one thing, one important thing, if I understand correctly, is language learning uh, strengthens the parts of the brain which tend to deteriorate first um, if Alzheimer's disease sets in the frontal parts of the brain and the hippocampus, uh, most notably. So if you strengthen those parts of the brain through foreign language learning, um, then you're helping to protect your brain against Alzheimer's disease. Secondly is um, foreign language learning can help to develop new neural pathways, complex neural pathways. Alzheimer's disease develops in the synapses where two neurons are communicating. If that gets blocked up, it seems that the, the, the synapse of the neurons can, can die off. But the more, the more synapses and neural pathways that you have, the more your brain can compensate for that naturally as you get older. So it is possible, according to the NUN study, and for this I recommend Lisa Genova's TED Talk. She's a neuroscientist and she, she wrote Still Alice. Still Alice is a famous film um, on this issue, exploring this issue, starring Julianne Moore. Uh, but Lisa Genova's TED Talk, uh, which is what really drew my attention to, um, to this issue of being able to possibly prevent Alzheimer's disease in 30% of the cases. Right. Around 30% of cases can be prevented, it seems. Um, so it seems that you know, many things, not only dance, not only foreign language education, can help to develop these neural pathways that can protect the brain, even if you develop fully-fledged Alzheimer's disease. As long as you've got enough backup pathways, you might you know, live a long, healthy life without showing any, any symptoms. Okay. So, yeah. I'm really conscious of the time, and I know that there's one more topic that Stephanie would really like to talk about. I think, I think it's an important topic for us to think about. So you, you're based in Saga, Ken. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, there's, this, there's a belief in Japan that Saga Ken's not, not so well known. Um, and this is one of your, your things that you're currently working to change. So could you well, tell us about this? There's a reason why Saga is not well known. It's between Fukuoka and Nagasaki. Uh, so one of my graduate students told me um, in one of the classes where I was doing the dance program uh, that Saga has its own original dance. My jaw hit the floor. Saga? There's dancers in Saga? Especially after all my students have been complaining about dancing. <laughs> and she said, yes, she said, it's called Menburyu. I said, Menburyu? What does that mean? And you can see um, there's a YouTube video on my Furyu website. Furyu is a beautiful word. It basically means drifting in the breeze. 
that feeling of flying when you're dancing, which I really love in Zumba and aerobics as well. Men is only no men, demon mask. So it's drifting in the breeze wearing a demon mask. That's what it is. And you can see the dancers dancing through the rice fields wearing their wigs. I liked wigs anyway, so I really, I was drawn to this dance. And the ladies wear these wonderful flower hats, and I like flowers, I, I teach you Gabbana, and I love flowers. So two things, wigs and flowers, I'm in. And um, really wonderful. But I was like, what is it? So I started looking into this, and then the next slide. So you can see at the top here, uh, Saga is the top left map, the little red blob, that's where Saga Prefetch is located. And you can see in the middle one, it, um, it lies between Fukuoka, where I live, and Nagasaki. Nagasaki's famous, isn't it? Probably the most famous of the three. Fukuoka's pretty famous in Japan, but Saga? No. But you can see that also Kyushu is uh, you know, the closest point to South Korea, and also not so far from China. Uh, now, if we look at the bottom, the bottom two maps, you can see that the, the part I've circled uh, used to be called Hizen. Have you heard of Hizen? Mm. No, Hizen. You see, I hadn't heard of Hizen. But uh, Hizen was divided into two prefectures, Saga and Nagasaki, so it broke. It was divided, it split, it broke away. What happened there? Well, that's interesting history in itself. Um, but please remember Hizen, Hizen. Mm. Um, okay, so what we have here, do you recognize any of these pictures as being Japanese? Does it look Japanese to you? It does, okay. On the left, you see a gold seal with uh, a picture that I've circled in red. What do you think is in the image? It's an image of what? Apparently, it's a snake. Do you know what it is? Do you know who gave it to who and when? No? Okay, it's called the King Ing. It was apparently uh, delivered from China around AD 58. And it was delivered to, I think it was the Kingdom of Na in the country of Wa, or something like that. <laughs> but it was given by the Chinese emperor of the time in recognition for the fact that there was a country here that was worth political recognition. And this seal was found on the island of Shikanoshima, which is just off the, well, attached to the coast of Fukuoka. But you look at the shape, and then one of my students pointed out that this, this image looks very similar to the top right mask that I circled in red, which uh, was an old mask found in Kashima in Saga. And uh, this is a female mask. You see the male mask is on the, the left with the tusks. The female mask with the open mouth is on the right. And it seems, I think, according to the Kashima City Hall website, this is a protected mask dance. Initially, they thought these were, these were membryu masks, old membryu masks. But I think they're Tsuina masks. Have you heard of Tsuina? Setsubong. Have you heard of Setsubong? Yeah. Setsubong is from Tsuina. And Tsuina, I think, is from China. Nuo. Nuo. Um, very old Chinese folk religion. Um, so the, these two masks at the top date back maybe to about 1500 sometime. Um, the bottom masks, the two, these are membryu masks at the bottom, and you can see the one on the right that I've circled, that, again, the female mask, these are membryu masks. Um, and mem this Otonashi membryu, which is one of the registered cultural mask dances of Kashima, it's registered uh, cult pre prefectural cultural property. Um, this is very old. Apparently, if people have their facts right, it goes back to about 1530, right. the Battle of Tadinawate, when the Ryuzoji clan. Um, with the help of Nabeshima, conquered Ouchi coming in from Yamaguchi, what is now Yamaguchi. There's a long history there. Yeah, yeah. And is, is the idea, just to kind of, because I'd like to take some audience questions, mm. this history is um, unwritten largely yes. and orally transmitted. Yes. And that's something you're trying to, um, I guess, document as well. It's dying out. Yeah. It's dying out. That Japan's densho no culture, orally transmitted culture, it's not written down. So when the people who are carrying the culture die off, and most of them are old, it's gone. There's masses of it countrywide. It's the law changed last year to move the cultural management power from Tokyo out to the prefectures. And only now, Saga and other prefectures are actually trying to uh, use questionnaire-based research, I think, to try to find out what they have, because they don't even know what they have themselves. <coughs> And I guess linking it to everyone in the room today, what's, what could be our role in, in using this in our classrooms? Okay, now this part I want to link back to native speakerism, okay. to some extent, to some extent, because it's dealing with 
the issues of national identity. And one, one argument is that uh, otherness, we, foreigners, are, from one angle, being used as a point of contrast through which to define and essentialize and reify Japanese national identity. Um, but because people from other cultures can come in and then see these really precious aspects. Um, so for example this, I was in the Yomiuri Shimbun for making a, a dance fitness program inspired by this mass dance. And one thing that they like is the fact that I'm a gaijin coming in, doing my best to preserve Japanese traditional culture. Um, but I think we can help. We can really, really help. And I think they need. I think J Japan, Japanese government needs our help in trying to protect this old culture, which, as far as I can see through my research with students, goes back to the Silk Road. So I don't see this as being just Japanese traditional local culture. Through through yaks, yaks, <laughs> yak hair. Um, I want to highlight the fact that Japan was a terminus, in fact not far from it, Nara, I think, was a terminus of the Silk Road, which ran all the way through, through China and Tibet, all the way to Italy, up to Genoa and Venice. All the cultures over thousands of years that have fed into those trade routes. Japan benefited enormously from the Silk Road. Kyoto, based on Xi'an, Old Chang'an, where the Silk Road started, masses of culture came through China. So to me, I don't see this Japanese traditional Dentro Gaino culture as only being Japanese. I see it as being international world heritage. And I think that we have to try to protect that, especially as we enter the age of robotics. The robots are going to start asking, what does it mean to be human? We have to be able to answer. So we have time before robots get too much hold of our society to actually think who we are as human beings, where we have come from. The oldest Homo sapiens fossils, I think, were found in Morocco, dating back 300,000 years. We're quite recent in the timeline of, of life on this earth. We're not immortal as a species. And so it's really time for us, and as language teachers, we can do that. We can look thematically at where we have, where we have come from, the process, the processes through which we have developed, and where we go from now on. And one aspect of that is protecting this traditional culture. And I hope to see the JET program activated in this regard, because teachers from so many countries are already there in schools being underused in the JET program. And so through community endeavors with students and teachers of various subjects, researching the local traditional culture in its local, national, and international aspects is something that Japanese government can do really quickly at no extra cost because they're getting paid anyway, and it will be really good fun. So that's what I'd like to see. Okay, thank you very much. So now we'll, we'll take some, I have, I have some questions here from you, the audience. Thank you very much. So um, a couple of people um, are asking about the JAL Association itself, mm. and should we be using these terms, um, in air quotes, native speaker or non-native speaker, as, as categorizations to investigate and address inequalities caused by it? Yes, and that's a very, very important question. And so, actually, the ILA World Congress in, in Rio, I had a, um, a network, a group of people, we, we, we discussed that in Rio in 2017. And there's definitely, you know, a, a quite a legitimate point of view, I think, um, that suggests that really the, the, the use of the term native speakerism, in itself, it, in a sense, is problematic, uh, because we are perpetuating, propagating, spreading uh, this ideology through the use of the word, all these books that I've published, it's spreading. And so that's, that's one you know, thing to be aware of, and to be very, very careful about that. But on the other hand, um, I don't know if you've heard the term zombie category. Zombie category is a term that I like very, very much. So this idea of native speaker is something that is both alive and dead at the same time. In a sense, a native speaker doesn't really exist, and that's what more people are arguing these days. The idea of native speakers do not exist is, is, is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. Uh, but on the other hand, you can't interrogate the problems presented by the existence of the, this, this fallacious concept and negative uh, consequences from society without language to describe it. So I think you have to really treat the term very, very carefully. And, and notably, Adrian Holiday's definition, very different from the one that uh, Damien and I developed based on his definition, and we don't agree. So there's no actual agreed definition of native speakers. You know, so there is no fixed definition, it's not in a dictionary, that is a battleground. And so people have to really engage in and negotiate uh, using this concept for, for, you know, for, for justifiable social purposes, I think. One of, one of the points that came up when we spoke earlier was how 
maybe this, this idea of the native speaker is actually reinforcing Japanese nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent is, is that the case, do you think? Um, yes, I think, um, I think in the sense that, that um, otherness, so that in group outgrow dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, people, culture is largely unconscious. So we can't see our own culture easily unless we see something that's different. We think, oh gosh, that's different, and therefore it's not me. And so by, by being presented with something that's different, then you see what's me or what is us, what is our, our national culture. And foreigners coming in, oh, Japanese people are this, this, that. Um, yes, so, but to overcome that requires the ability, the critical ability to deconstruct language, to deconstruct culture, to see uh, how language itself, words, concepts can shift, you know, uh, where all the foreign teachers of foreign world and non foreign world. I mean, they're playing with language, right? It's trying to undermine the concept itself. That's what I was trying to do in that title. You know, you have to really be able to see through language. The criticality, I think, is the key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in, in some respects, being othered or being the other, you talked about that that could maybe help towards. Yes, I think so. certainly for me, because I, um, I was really struggling when I first started my PhD, but definitely developing a strong academic framework for understanding social psychology in particular. Mm. Cognitive psychology and social psychology, the basic concepts and seeing how they were functioning you know, in my everyday life in these difficult employment situations that I was experiencing myself and, and seeing other people experience, definitely that gave me a, a strong foundation for living and staying and thriving in Japan. I, could, I, I wouldn't be here without that, I don't think. So yes, I would recommend it for anybody. So on one, on one hand, it takes the other or the alien to kind of maybe talk about these these narrative these stories of ancient Japan. Right. But on the other hand there's there's also discrimination too implied. So it kind of seems it's difficult. It's not easy. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah, so you would have to develop some skill at managing these things. Hmm. Um, but if if um, you have an in group and an out group, if the out group members are human, that means you're gonna have some kind of discrimination going on between the two groups. So as I recount in, in one of these books we had a discussion at Durham University, what would it take to get the human race to see themselves as being one unified group. You need aliens, <laughs> right? So that, that's the only thing that's gonna make a difference. In the absence of aliens, what I, I suggest is, is basically Alzheimer's disease can serve that role for us. Um, nobody wants Alzheimer's disease. I don't think anybody wants anybody else to have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease does not discriminate. It doesn't matter where you're from, how much money you have or anything, except women tend to suffer more than men. There is an issue there, which isn't understood fully yet. But um, and robots too. You know, when robots come along and they get they get strong, and then eventually, eventually, we're human robots, and that the whole thing. And digital natives. That was that was in the plenary this morning. You see, native is actually you know even going on to robotic age yeah. through through this yeah. this event. Yeah. Um, somebody's asked a question about Alzheimer's disease. Um, mm. Can you speak about how Alzheimer's disease is now considered uh, type three diabetes, and how it relates to dance and language acquisition? So, I mean, as I have a question on this myself. So as, as language teachers, how can we make our classes, if we're teaching older learners or even younger learners, how, how can we make our classes focused on these brain-based kind of... Okay, so I think if you look at Thomas Bach's work and, and Diana, the long Polish surname, um, they, they have a project, at least Thomas Bach has a project called Lingo Flamingo. And if you look that up, you'll see that they have a project of uh, teaching foreign languages to uh, older people uh, with a view to dementia prevention. And it's a research project, I think. And they summarize briefly the approach they take. Um, includes intercultural issues, it includes memory stimulation, uh, you know, communication-based, and, and multisensory, trying to activate all of the senses uh, through different kinds of activities in, in a fun kind of, kind of way. And, and then dance. Um, physical movement. Yep. Um, I think the hippocampus, so, so the hippocampus is an important part. So the two, two little seahorse-like structures kind of behind the eyes between the ears. Uh, that's where new, new neurons, baby neurons pop up. And you want a big hippocampus uh, to protect yourself from Alzheimer's. And so the hippocampus is involved in memory formation, but also in spatial navigation. Um, so, and taxi drivers in London apparently have a very big hippocampus because they're navigating around all the time. Mm -hmm. So having a big hippocampus <laughs> and strong frontal brain, um, which seem to be able to be developed through dance and language um, and cognitive training, although the jury's out, these are general recommendations. 
put forward by certain researchers in certain studies that I'm picking up on. Uh, so what I want you to do is to, is to encourage you to research it independently as far as you can. Um, yeah. Okay, so I guess my final question relates to that. Um, do you think that this at-risk culture that's dying out, do you think that this is kind of an authentic material that we as teachers should be engaging with more ourselves? And do you think that in terms, if we if we look over to Alzheimer's disease and maybe older language learners, do you think that we should be using this kind of um, bygone culture to kind of stimulate learning? Um, yes, at one point is that because this culture is orally transmitted, it really depends on the brain health of the, the people carrying the culture. So if the, the people who are carrying the culture forget it, it's gone. So my recommendation to the Board of Education in Saga um, is to implement an Alzheimer's disease prevention program as part of the preservation of this orally transmitted culture in order to protect the memories um, that, are to, that are there right now. Um, but also it, it suggests that intergenerational communication is, is important, and I, I don't want to force young people to take an interest or to take part, but I think that they should know about it. And, um, and I, I'd like to see schools involved in their local communities in investigating what these, um, these, these, these traditional forms, very ancient forms of culture are. You know, within a, within a healthy program that takes a global view, a national view, a regional view, with a view to undermining nationalism as one of its aims, as well as Alzheimer's prevention. So it needs to be multidisciplinary. Um, and because Alzheimer's disease, the, the brain changes start in the early 40s, with the build-up of amyloid beta, early 40s. The people in the early, the early 40s need to be accessed, so I think they can be accessed through the kids in the school. So if the children, different levels, have education in Alzheimer's disease prevention, they can access the parents. If you look at something like My Brain Robbie, if you look at My Brain Robbie, you'll find dementia prevention guidelines for kids. Because, you know, reliance on computers and iPads and sitting down and being on the computer the whole time is not good for the brain. Exercise, fitness, getting the blood into the brain to clean the brain of all of the, the uh, accumulation of amyloid beta and harmful proteins which, which cause Alzheimer's disease is really important. And, uh, yeah, in relation to ancient culture and modern culture and robotics and future culture. So it's getting the balance between the past, the present and the future. I think, yeah. So, um, you talked about your personal life story, and I can kind of see how that all links to your, your professional work and your, your research, too. Um, so, thank you very much today. And yeah, round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that, and many thanks once again to Stephanie. We'll be back soon with the third and final interview from Pansy 2019 in which I talk to Professor Kensaku Yoshida about language education policy. For more about the Teflology podcast, visit teflology-podcast.com or you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or iTunes. Thanks for listening.